Hello again, everyone. Melth here. With a video many people have been requesting about my builds for Act 2, and I'll be discussing in general what I think are optimal builds for this part of the game, as well as some very important secret mechanics about things like spellcasting ability modifiers for multi-class characters, which are really important to understand if you want to be optimizing in this phase, I would say, and in Act 3 as well, so stay tuned for that. This will also be doubling as an episode of my Baldur's Gate 3 challenge run, details of which of course are in the YouTube video description. I'll be hitting level 8 for my characters this time and getting set up for my no long rest run of Act 2. Watch out for spoilers throughout this run. One thing I discovered while working on this episode was a bug with the bugbearer merchant, Lantarv. It seems that if you leave this area and go back to the Act 1 areas, he will permanently lose out some of his dialogue options for no good reason, basically, and so that spoils a chance to get some unique items from him and also see some unique conversation things. So I had to reload from my last backup and redo some stuff so I can get back to where things were, and then actually get this dialogue. Isn't it? He seems to recognize her even if she's in disguise sometimes, which is perhaps also a bug. What was Flo doing here? Didn't think to quiz her about her business. This whole interaction is honestly kind of weird. I'm not sure I'm going to take it as being canonically happening because, again, he'll see through disguises somehow, and we really wouldn't want to reveal that Carlac is here, but whatever. That said, she would have choked the life out of me if I ever turned my back on her. The fact that she knows where I am or where I might be going doesn't exactly. Yeah, it's very concerning, but. It also makes you wonder why she doesn't help Mizora, although maybe Mizora wasn't captured yet. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. What did she want, anyway? She came dressed as a novice, gave me three soul coins. Said Odd they didn't, you know, Titan defense after having a devil visit them disguised as a novice, but... For you, she'd consider it a favor owed. Soul coins, huh? This could come in handy. And I feel like my character would probably tell her, no, we're not taking a bunch of these helpless souls in coin form for you to just chew up and use as fuel, but we'll go along with it just to see the conversation. Sure. But she did have a condition. For every I hate this guy's mustache, by the way. You've got to hear the story he has to die the soul trapped inside. There you have it. Flo came all this way just to try to make me feel like shit. Maybe you shouldn't feel great about using people's souls as fuel. But for some reason there's no way to follow up with Carlac about that that I'm aware of. Your Flo did some devil woo-woo and stuck him in my head. Couldn't forget now if I wanted to. Do you want the coins or not? First coins got the soul of a woman named Mavery. She was born to a cruel mother, and a violent father, and three evil brothers, all named Balder. Cruel, violent, and lazy about names. Off in all her life. When she was a girl of 15, she sold her soul to Tiamat in exchange for someone who would love her. Tiamat is a god rather than a typical devil, but she's a really low power god who ended up just kind of living in the first layer of the hells and failed even there. And was only allowed to say because like it was just that she was so completely incompetent that she couldn't pose a threat to the devils, basically. So, uh, no divine street cred. Poor guy. The scud of her soul is yours now. Thanks, I guess. This one has got the soul of a man named Frakes. Lived in a village near Neverwinter. Hit hard by the worst hunger in a thousand years. Frakes called out for help. Prayed for his children to have meat to eat. Zariel answered. Made old Frakes grow flesh upon flesh after flesh. His wee ones had all the meat they could stomach. He should have known. I mean, it just said he prayed rather than prayed to her in particular, but maybe that's implied here. Last one's got the soul of a little boy named Ongear. Eight years old. He liked playing in the sun with his friends. That children are allowed to make deals with devils really suggests there's a problem with the divine laws here. We don't let kids make contracts for a reason. Scratch. Well, thanks, Flo. Hearing a bunch of desperate horror. That is one laggy eye in the background there. Was the point. You got three soul coins out of the bargain, didn't you? I'd quit whinging if I were you. Indeed. Let's pretend this conversation never happened. That means our business is done. Unless you've got actual gold to hand. 
So we'll lead this, and then if we talk to him again, that should allow us to go into the conversation where we can tell him to show us his secret stash, because we talked to Zarel before. Zaboying Rel. Took a liking to you, did she? Watch yourself. She breaks her toys once she's done with them. I don't think this is really follow it up on, but I don't know. I've only played through Act 2 once before. Anyway, so some new wares unlocked. We'll come back and buy those things at a better price once I've done my proper setup. Get moving, will you? But speaking of getting moving, over there, before we go, we should probably grab that Iron Bandit Shield Plus One, because he just won't sell that. I don't steal anything in this game unless there's no other way to obtain it, because stealing is too easy, but, like, again, there's no other way to get it, so we'll do it that way. Oh, if everyone else minds their business, I'll be fine. Nothing suspicious about that at all. One issue I've run into, by the way. So this bug where I permanently can't get back to my character's actual face and I'm stuck in disguises all the time, makes merchants that I bought favor with not like me anymore. Because whether a merchant likes you or not depends on your current face. So one exploit I would never normally use is respect to level 1 and then give a merchant only 400 gold to make them like you. That saves a lot of money compared to making them like you at higher levels. Normally I wouldn't do that, I think it's pretty cheesy, but here where I'm trying to partially undo the effects of this dumb bug that's happening. Thou hast now a bosom companion. Hmm. We now get this dialogue from Withers because I guess there's some kind of romantic connection between Korolak and Ballista. Seeking Which I didn't really intend to start. Hope that doesn't get in the way the thing is with Nithara. Because that I want to try that for the first time this game. Recall that in time all becomes dust. That's not true. Some of it is teeth. Those are not the same as bones. While I'm getting set up, this is also a good time to finally get that Lathander blessing that I talked about last time. I think it's more useful to use in Act 2 than in Act 1. It gives you plus 1d4 radiant damage on attacks, which is really nice against some of the shadows and other undead in Act 2 for one thing. The last thing to do before I can begin my great shopping spree, which of course is required so I can talk about my items for my builds, is to win the battle outside this statue that we saw before, and then I get this Shar blessing that'll boost my charisma for the rest of the act as long as I do it in one day, and thereby make it get better prices. I just want to optimize the shopping as much as possible. All is ash and meat. So we can see that there are some Shadow Curse Harpers around here as well as some actual shadows. And we probably want to engage those on our terms. So because I'm not fully kitted out for this, my initiatives are not as good as they usually are. I'll talk about how I've respect and so forth once I've got my items. I think one thing I want is just to kind of position Karlak. That's probably the most important thing for her. Just so that we can get these people into the light of Lathander. Speaking of which, let's toggle it on and off. Sometimes it doesn't work unless you toggle it. There we go. Shall we cut and run? I started to probably have to use his dash here to get enough movement. And this will probably kill in one hit. Thereby giving him his Bloodless Elixir extra attack. We wanted to take out the Shadows first because they can do this kind of teleport. We don't want to deal with that. Some of these guys are melee, so they are not a problem. So next order of business is this ranged one, I think. Still breathing, despite everything. Survival is all that matters. Now this is my happy place. Alright, so the rest of them should have to come to me. My guys are all either invisible or well back. Sorry, choose that one for the free extra attack. Do the bloodless elixir again. We'll leave that one for Ballista, so Ballista can also get the extra attack. A 
sense with decent tactics. Let's move. You feel a rush of outrage. What a surprise. The goddess of always screwing over her followers screwed over her followers. Who could have seen this coming? It's like making a deal with Clavicus Vile in the Elder Scrolls or something. He's the god of only making bad deals. Anyway, as I read these plaques, we'll find out there's a specific order to read them in, basically. There's something about curious. these plaques. We need to get one more, and that will open up the not-so-secret passageway. What was, that? what was that, he asked, as we open up this obvious secret passageway that was right next to us. This is a pretty cool set of all-day-long buffs we can get in here. There are three statues. One of them is for Charisma in the middle, then there's one for Intelligence, one for Wisdom. They give a plus five bonus to that stat all day long, but only if you make a quite difficult saving throw with that stat. So you must be good at it already, otherwise take a penalty all day long, which is devastating. So I have respect for this act so that I have now an odd number of Charisma on the person I want to give the Charisma bonus to. So one easy way to optimize this is to give out a few items we can collect from Act 1, like the Safeguard Shield, Corellin's Grace while wearing no armor, and then also, of course, the Ring of Protection, which I've talked about how to get before from Maul. The order of operations for that quest matters quite a lot. But anyway, that's an easy plus four bonus, and with that plus resistance and things like that, it should be pretty easy to make these checks. Just to put my hands on everything. Are you bold of heart and sharp of tongue? Can you turn any and all to the Dark Lady's cause? A fiery crackle echoes. Now, I think, as I mentioned before, in character, Balas doesn't really have a patron. He's not that kind of warlock. So we won't be taking that option here, although it is mechanically advantageous. This is a can't fail with all these bonuses. Confidence surges through you. You feel like there is nothing you can't do. No this will be a quite powerful bonus for the rest of this act. The statue seems to agree and approve. Well, this is now at a nice 24 Charisma. And remember, he's adding double that to his damage thanks to the potent robe. Will you accept Shah's test of your intellect? Easily done again. You feel a small pulse of energy race up your spine. And a strange sensation... Of acceptance. Do you think yourself And Astarian will take the wisdom one, because he'll be able to add that to his damage due to the diadem that he has. And no one else really benefits all that much from it. This one would be harder, but I have plenty of inspiration set up for it, and these are a lot of bonuses anyway, so I can definitely do it. A warm swell rises through you. Acceptance. You are worthy. It opens at Secret Passes over there. We can do a battle if we antagonize Shar, which we'll certainly be doing, but we'll come back for that once I can have Minthar properly in the party. Let's start with buying the interesting new items. It's always a major power-up in this game when you unlock new merchants, because really, unlike in many games, there's not a clear power distinction between the things you can get off of merchants versus what you find in dungeons or at the end of epic quests and whatnot. You can get super strong stuff from people like Quartermaster Tally here. This is an amazing medium armor that basically blows every previous armor out of the water. It lets you add your full dexterity to your armor class while also having you know, 15 base, so that just immediately outclasses all light armor in the game, and pretty much all heavy armor too. This is also an amazing cloak. There has been a major shortage of good cloaks in the game up until this point. Suddenly there are lots of good ones here in Act 2. This shield would normally be pretty impressive, and I'll probably buy it just for the extra level 1 spell slot when spell slots are so precious to me, but it's not that big a deal, really. This staff, I would normally say is pretty good, because getting a fireball once per day is a nice bonus, but because of course I'm not doing any long rest, that basically means one fireball per act, so that's really not that great, so I'll probably skip that one. I would normally pass on these gloves. I think they're a little bit overrated, but in this case, I might actually buy them and use them for a starium for just like one or two levels, basically, and then I won't need them ever again. This amulet is pretty great. Shield is an amazing spell. Getting it yeah, even just once is nice, so definitely want to have that. Wisdom saving throws is nice, too. 
We'll be happy to have more of these elixirs, they're pretty rare. We aren't allowed by my challenge rules to cast this spell yet, because we can't have a high level spell slot to cast it legitimately, but I'll be buying it for the day when I can do that. It's smart to stock up on these slaying X creature type arrows, especially the ones like fiends or dragons or whatever. There's some tough fights against those types of enemies, and doubling your damage against them is really well worth it. Damon will mostly have his good stock in Act 3. He's kind of the Gyarados of blacksmithing. Right now, he's got some so-so stuff. You can make an argument for buying this bow, I would say. You know, getting a stat stick bow that gives resistance to two damage types is pretty nice, especially given that one of them is fire, which is very common. But it's still just not that impressive, I would say, overall. I tend to take damage so sudden I don't really care much about resistance. But this one is great if you have a strength character in the party. It's often quite viable to, you know, hand this to someone who's using a you know, throw build or titan string bow or things like that and has invested in strength. I don't have any strength builds though, so for me it's not that great. Mattis actually has some decent stuff now. It's not all just joke items anymore. Some of it still is. She now kind of sells stuff that Maul used to sell, like elixirs. So that's good, I guess. Hmm. <laughs> Don't buy this arrow, maybe. This is okay for just you know, creating fog clouds, although using your action on it is definitely not worth it. But if you have a rogue, creating a fog cloud with a bonus action could be worth something once in a while. And these are actually really, really good. Now with Land Tarp, it's usually I like to make him like you without giving him any money, so you might as well do that. It. I do not peddle. I put weapons in worthy hands. The Absolute needs warriors for her crusade. But I see only weaklings in this place. Prove it! Who's singing your name? There are lots of good options here, but this is an easy one as a bard. Unfailable for me. Normally talk like that's empty. But there's something behind those words of yours. I can feel it. Want any so anyway, that'll max out his attitude toward you, which is convenient. Pay less than the rest. This is kind of a joke item, so if you don't know... Bigby is one of the wizards of early D&D players, who therefore was immortalized in spell names. Most things involving hands doing things. So, I think who's a large fellow is probably, you know, has a giant hand for that reason. And so instead of being Bigby, it's Big Boy, which is said to be Bigby's dog or whatever. Quite a nice hat here. Everything that gives initiative is wonderful to have, and plus one spell save to see is icy on the cake. This is probably the best shield in the game. Just gives plus three to initiative rolls, advantage and perception is gravy. What more could you want, really? Plus three to initiative is incredible. This armor is really good and pretty much immediately outclasses all the adamantine armor we had. These potions are amazing, but I won't be using them because that would be breaking my no rest rule, so I'll avoid them. But if you're playing a normal run, of course these are great to have. Sparing Roa Moonglow in Act 1 really starts to pay off now. She has a lot of special items here. Yeah, this is what I could have bought in Act 1, and I kind of regret not doing so. Just being a plus one stat stick bow for initiative is pretty useful, so I'll be glad to have that. This weapon is deceptively really, really good. I mean, ignore the dragon breath part, that part is worthless, but draconic elemental weapon. The thing about that is basically it's a major bonus you can add to an ally's weapon. You can just kind of cast it on them, then unequip this thing later on, and just have that buff, and that's pretty sweet. The net or misser is a strong argument, I would say, for why... Although the Titan String Bow is a decent competitor to double hand crossbows, double hand crossbows always have their advantages. And one of them is just this thing. A crossbow that does force damage is really, really, really useful. A lot of enemies of the game resist even magical piercing damage, but almost nothing resists force damage. So, really quite valuable, and I definitely want that thing. This is another item that normally is amazing. It's another thing that kind of outclasses all light armor in the game, and most other medium armors, and even most heavy armors, but letting out your full dexterity, because Every party should have everyone have high dexterity all the time, pretty much. But I think I might pass on it for now because two of my party members are wearing no armor with mage armor, which is one of the few things that can really compete with this. So I'll probably pass on that. And this I will probably pick up now. It wouldn't really have been very good before, 
But I now have enough ways to do reverberation to enemies, and we'll have even more ways shortly once I hit up a treasure chest upstairs right here in Moonrise Tower, so that inflicting days to become a real possibility, and that's a great status condition, so I definitely want to have that option. And over here in this back room is one of the creepiest characters in the entire game. She can make the most innocuous lines of dialogue just sound gross. A good moment to talk. Welcome back, true soul. I'd like to offer my services, if you're willing. I trade in blood, and the potions that can be wrung from it. So, really quite valuable. Makes his unique elixirs that stack with regular elixirs. We definitely want those. One drop, I can brew a rather potent potion for you. We also, if we make a skill check here, can identify that she really has some other kind of plan that can allow us to make money. Research, naturally. A little experimentation, perhaps. I have an innate curiosity for all things sanguine. I don't know why I didn't get the check there. Let me exit out and see I if I can get it. Should you change your mind? Although perhaps there's one more thing we could discuss. Now let's do this. She gives a very unique power up this way. Or one of their spawn, at least. Oh, don't worry. We're all friends. <laughs> Absolute. I won't bite. Oh, I prefer if you did. I assume he belongs to you? <laughs> I do like pretty much all of these options. I'm sure he really believes that. How utterly adorable. Do you have a name, Spawn? A Starian, but hold on. <laughs> now, a Starian. I've dreamt of being bitten by a vampire since I was a young girl. I'm sorry, you want to be bitten? He'll then act as though everyone wants this, basically, and it's not surprising. So this is just one unusual conversation for him, I guess. Life and death. Yes, I want it. Sadly, there's no often just have a story and killer when he bites her, which would be a pretty funny outcome. Power that forever increases the strength. This is the only way to obtain this potion, which I don't have any strength built in this party, but it is one of a kind. Yours, if you bite me, I will have to decline. Excuse me? This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and you're squandering it. I gave you my answer. Uh, can't you talk some sense into your obstinate charge? I'm sorry, but could you excuse us a moment? She does have super elf hearing, and we're not really <laughs> moving away from her. Trading me for some, some, some potion. Because there's something wrong with her. It doesn't stop him from biting people like Gale and Carlock and then being surprised when their blood, you know, burns him or is necrotic or whatever. I can't say. It just smells wrong. Maybe we should do some of that so he'll stop trying to bite us. Drinking it wouldn't kill me, but it would not be pleasant. I don't have all day, true soul. You literally do have all day. Fine. If he doesn't like you, he can leave the party over this, but he likes me pretty well. I've had a sudden change of heart. After all, who could resist such a delectable neck? Hold very, very still. Incredible. You're not holding still, you idiot. That should be pretty fatal. <laughs> Anyway, I hate Astarian, and so does Ballista, so the potion is really uh, just a side benefit. <clears throat> Not to your taste. <laughs> You're fetid, full of corruption. I feel exquisite, though. So here's my part of the bargain. I hope you find it as satisfying as I found this. It was everything I imagined, and then more. I'll be able to put this to good use. How? Well, let's see if we can get the dialogue about what she wants to do with her blood. With one drop, I can brew a rather potent potion for you. The rest, I keep for myself. No one gave it to me. 
Rather ironically, it runs in the bloodline. We, a Blodras, are naturally curious folk. Always have been. Research, naturally. We, a Blodras, are simply curious by nature. You realize why the name rings familiar? How the Blodra was purged a century ago by an alliance. Pretty routine. Drow are always randomly massacring each other. Among the many crimes tallied against them, their reckless experimentation with illithid breeding stock. Blessed by the absolute, but not blinded by it. Now I simply must study you. He's willing to go along with this because he thinks that having more knowledge about how the absolute is working could be beneficial. Unless they are not the makers, but simply the means. Yeah, he agrees with that. Be a secret worth knowing. So let me adjust my offer. Your blood and your silence. In exchange for the... We can't tell literally anyone about this whole mind flare thing anyway, even though there's documentation we can present to them, signed by their leaders and whatnot. There's just no way to interact with that. Well, that's why we're trading, no? I assure you, the potions are more than worth their weight. Just a little proof. This is not going to be a useful one for me. It's a potion that I won't use because it's a healing type potion because I'm a half elf. Never mind this fake face that I'm stuck in. A little pain for a lot of gold. And. There we are. All of your very best traits in a bottle. Use it well. A starian as an elf can get the best elixir in my opinion. So You've come in the spirit of trade, I hope. With one drop, I can grow... Do we have to go through this again to find out why she wants it? The rest, I keep for myself. The Elixir of Elven Elegance is insanely good. Oh, here's 200 gold that I got for that, by the way. I thought at first it was 10 feet of movement speed. No, 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 they mean it. 10 meters of movement speed. All day, stacking with a regular Elixir. Now, the day after, you have a penalty, but, like... That doesn't really matter very much. That is incredible speed. The other perks are nice too. So Orange is kind of our alchemist for this area, although I would say she's really not as good as Dareth overall. She sells a smattering of other items too. This hat is surprisingly cheap for how good it is. It's equivalent to the much praised hat of fire acuity, which you usually get from the ox only in Act 2. The uh, strange ox, that is. I killed it in Act 1 because I couldn't really justify the exploit in character that can let you get the ring of bonuses while well in disguise back in Act 1 was so good in the hat in Act 2. This is pretty good for someone like Karla who can do a lot of thunder damage too. There are many ways to do thunder damage and boost yourself up with arcane acuity almost as much as you can do with fire damage. So pretty strong I would say overall. This is pretty nice too. You know resisting powerful conditions like paralyze is important so is ignoring difficult terrain so we'll be happy to have that for the right circumstances. This ring, I think, is kind of overhyped because there are many, many, many ways to get yourself advantage fairly reliably, as I think I've shown with my tactics in this game. But nice to have this as an option once in a while when you have advantage and you can't really get it some other way. So here we are back at Dareth Bone Cloak in Act 1. I'm just going to buy some elixirs and basic alchemy ingredients and things like that. I've mentioned before that because I can't long rest on this run, going to merchants each time I level up is one of the best ways to restock their inventories and get new items out of them. Time to level up Ballista. You can see his actual face here, but you can never ever again see it in game properly for some reason. Even with the magic mirror, it'll show this face, it'll show it being restored, then I go back out of the mirror and it is gone again, and I'm back to disguise. This is a very fun level up for Lore Bard. You get magical secrets at this level. Now that means you get basically two spells from almost any class list in the game up to level three. That's some pretty good stuff. The no-brainer here is going to be Counterspell. That's an incredible ability to have access to. You want people in the party that have that. And unfortunately, because they don't have any sorcerers or wizards that are high enough level to get it, this is my only opportunity to do so. Now, beyond that, there are quite a few good options, really. Bards lack much direct offense, so things like Fireball. I mean, not bad, really. Hunger for Dar is a really great control spell from Warlocks. Nice big AoE, devastating debuffs, and decent damage, too. So, certainly very nice to have. Or, of course, Animate Dead will be really good when I hit next level and can get it cast as a 4th level spell to get 3 skeletal minions. I might go with that, although Hunger for Dar is really tempting. 
I'll probably end up picking up both eventually. I'm going to get more Magical Secrets at 10th Bard level. I might go with Hunger for Dara now, just for the uniqueness of it, I think. There aren't all that many great level 3 Bard spells, I would say. A lot of things are immune to fear, a lot of things are immune to hypnotic pattern, especially in this act, so... All right. Karlak is level 8 now, Cleric level 7, Wizard level 1. Not too much to talk about this level up. We unlock 4th level Cleric spells, but most of those aren't really that great. Banishment has some use as a control spell once in a while. We don't care too much about that stuff. Just wanted to point out a new scroll that's worth picking up whenever it becomes available, Planar Binding. Again, per my challenge rules, I can't cast that scroll yet, but I want to stockpile them for when I can. That's pretty useful in Act 3. So, Astarian has an interesting level up this time. Now, I plan to have him take a level in Fighter again, as he had last time, but for the time being, he's respec, now he's going to be taking a level 3 Rogue, so he can take, not Assassin, but Thief. Assassin, I will say, is really, really strong, but most of the runs where you're kind of choosing things with stealth and ways I won't be doing. Thief Rogue, though, is extremely strong in a more conventional way. You get a bonus, bonus action. Which, with me having hand crossbows, means I can get an extra attack every round, which is really, really strong. Well worth temporarily giving up, allowing the fighter to give me another combat style to add my dexterity to my offhand attack damage. I will get that back eventually, of course. So Minthar is a replacement for Lei Boing Zell. And we're going back to Druid at this point. I'll eventually re-pick up that level of Cleric that I had before, but for now I want to be level 7 Druid and level 1 Wizard, so I can unlock the excellent level 4 Druid spells. You might remember that I said the level 3 Druid spells are pretty trashy, but level 2 and level 4 are great, so we're now back now that we can actually get to the level 4 ones. Real standouts include uh, Conjure Woodland Being, so you get your own Dryad, which can cast at will Spike Growth, which is just incredible. I want that in every single fight from now on if I can get it. Other useful summon spells are there too, but that is the real standout. So you can see I have quite a party here. Let's talk about some basics as we get into the builds. So the first thing to say is that your build should really depend on what kind of run you're doing. A lot of classes that are normally very strong in this game, like Paladin or Swords Bard, phenomenal classes, for this run to be worthless. Because they depend very, very heavily on spending resources to be effective. You know, Bardic Inspirations for Swords Bards, or Smiting Spell Slots for Paladins. And in this run where I can't long rest, I can't get those things back really. So for me, they'd be pretty bad classes overall. I need sustainability. I need things I don't need to spend resources on very often. It's also really important for me to not take damage, because I can't really heal, because I can't do any long rest and can't drink any healing potions. So for me, avoiding damage altogether is tremendously important. To make sure that I do that, every single character has really, really good initiative. Karlak and Mithar both have alertness, Astarian has great dexterity and also has the Gloomsucker bonus, but Alyssa has stacked up multiple initiative items and might get alertness eventually too, so just maxing out that initiative so I always go first so I can destroy enemies before they can have a turn to hit me, that's really, really valuable. I mean, that's great in any kind of run, but especially on this one here. Another thing to think about is that my party is pure range and all have really, really good movement. So with good tactics and going first, the enemy cannot get to me at all most of the time if I use the terrain well. That's quite useful. They also, of course, as the kind of the backup have great armor class across the board here. You can see I'll have at least 21, they'll be getting even higher armor classes pretty soon. So even if enemies can get a turn and can hit me, they will probably miss their attacks anyway, especially given that Karlak and Mathara both have shield, Astarian has this to give him shield too, and Ballista has cutting words to make enemies miss as well. So it is extremely hard to hit me. That will help me sustain these few hit points over the course of this entire act. Now let's get into the specifics of what the characters are good at. So, it's important to know there's really only two valuable combat roles in this game. You're either a damage dealer or you're doing battlefield control. Nothing else is valuable. Tanking is a myth, healing is a noob trap. Don't waste your time on those things. So all my characters can do both damage and battlefield control, but some of them are specialized more in one or the other. Ballista is a lore bard six Warlock 2, and it eventually be a Lorebard 10 Warlock 2. Lorebard is just bar none the best out of combat class in the game. You get so many skills. You get expertise. You get jack of all trades to be good at skills that aren't even skills. You get tons of spellcasting. You get tons of utility. You get all kinds of amazing abilities. 
You get at level six magical secrets to give you things like counterspell, which is a great thing to have. Lord Bard is just a killer class outside of combat, but in combat, they're not really that great in terms of damage anyway. But two level dip in Warlock gives me amazing damage, actually. See, in this act, with Shar's Blessing and having Vesting Charisma, I have 24 Charisma now, a plus 7 modifier. So with Eldritch Blast, I can add that to my, you know, attack rolls, of course, making them really, really accurate. But I also, because of the Potent Robe and Agonizing Blast, add double that Charisma to my damage. So each of my two Eldritch Blasts per action gets to add 14 damage before actually even rolling the dice. And before including things like the Spell Sparkler. So... That is massive, massive damage, and it's force type, which is a really rare and valuable damage type, too. And it's at long range, and it pushes enemies back. It's a great, low investment, powerful ability. So that's why I have that set up for Ballista. And then kind of patching up his weaknesses, a lot of his items go to shoring up his bad initiative. You know, he has this given plus initiative, he has this given plus initiative. If I need it, I have some other items that can switch in for even more initiative, like a bow that gives plus one initiative, but... Right now, he has plus 7, that's good enough for most fights to always win. Then he has some utility items, like this is just great for just having massive bonuses to every skill check as your face character, so it's kind of utility there. The reason, of course, I'm using this build on the main character is that the main character kind of has to be the party face and do most of the things, so having them be the lower bar just kind of makes sense. And also, gives me a chance to pick Wood Half Elf, which is the best race for this class combination, because that gives me shield proficiency, which is great. And gives me a movement speed bonus, which is also just always great. So next up, we have Astarian here. So Astarian is my main weapon damage dealer, because as Astarian, he's the unique vampire bite ability to make him happy all day, which is plus one for free to all the rolls, basically, including attack rolls, which is really valuable if you have high damage, low accuracy attacks with Sharpshooter and things like that, which he does. Now, class-wise, he is a level five Gloomstalker, and now level three Thief Rogue. Dual wielding hand crossbows. You can make an argument for Titan String Bow, but I think that hand crossbows are as good or better most of the time. Now, what makes him so good is he gets tons and tons and tons of attacks. He gets two bonus action offhand attacks with his hand crossbows. Then he gets, of course, two main hand attacks with his main action. And then he has Bloodless Lectures to get even more attacks. And he's a Gloom Stalker, which gives him sustainably another attack every single combat. And that's really, really good. Sustainability, again, is crucial. As a Gloom Sucker, you know, Thief, he's not spending any resources. He just gets massive numbers of attacks every single combat. Now, I could make an argument for being an Assassin Gloom Sucker instead, but that kind of involves abusing stealth more than I want to for this challenge run. So that's why I'm a Thief instead of an Assassin. Certainly, Assassin Gloom Sucker is good if you don't mind abusing stealth, but I'm not going to be doing that. He also has some good utility, with Ranger giving him decent numbers of spells and so forth. Eventually take a level of Fighter to add his dexterity to his offhand damage. Right now he uses these gloves to do that, but eventually want to free up his glove slot and have a level of Fighter to do that instead. Plus unlock heavy armor proficiency with a level of Fighter would be nice too. Other than that, he's kind of pumping his accuracy and his damage. Bonus to dexterity here, he has the Hag could wish his dexterity further. Dynamic Arcane Synergy is really, really good with the Shar Blessing to his Wisdom right now, giving him 20 Wisdom. It triggers pretty much all the time, giving him Arcane Synergy, which then adds his Wisdom Spellcasting modifier to all his damage rolls, so another plus 5 there, basically. He then also has this for plus 2 damage, he has this for plus a d4 damage, so he gets a lot of damage bonuses. And then he has this to shore up his armor class, this likewise, to make it so he is hard to hit. Next up, in the Wizard Hat here, we've got Karlak. So, Karlek is my first main battlefield controller, but she also has great, great damage against multiple targets, is her thing. Astorian and Ballista are both great single target damage dealers, but Karlek's build is pretty much unmatched for multi target damage. What she is, is a Tempest Cleric with one level of Wizard. The reason that, that is really good in this game is in this game, if you're a Wizard, you can learn spells from scrolls as long as you have a sufficiently high spell slot of that level, but not necessarily just from pure Wizard. With one level of wizard, she only learned one level of wizard spells from her class itself, but from scrolls she can learn things up to fourth level now because she has fourth level spells also being a cleric. That is some great versatility in general there, and I highly recommend a level one wizard dip in almost any caster class, really. But also, with Tempest Cleric, she can max out damage of lightning spells, like Lightning Bolt. Normally she's kind of an okay blast spell, but for her maxing out the damage, that's 48 damage. Or if enemies are wet, that's 96 damage. To numerous targets at the same time. That is incredibly good for wiping out a large group of enemies in one shot. Better than the Star could do, better than Ballista could do. Now, to fully understand this build, it is crucial to understand how spellcasting ability modifiers work in this game. 
They determine a lot of how effective your spells are, and they do not work in a logical way, really. See, normally, wizards cast spells based on intelligence, and clerics cast spells based on wisdom. She has a great intelligence, but only an okay wisdom, so which is used for different things. Well, basically, it's like this. First of all, her racial features are based on charisma. That's true for most races. It's not true for high elves, whose cantrips and things like that are always based on intelligence, regardless of your class and whatnot. Most races give charisma-based things, high elf gives intelligence-based things. But everything else, basically, is determined by your class in one way or another. If you ever cast a wizard spell, that uses your intelligence. Cleric spells use your wisdom. But how does it work for things like casting spells from scrolls? Or things like this item that adds your ability modifier to your damage dealt with a cantrip? You might hope it would use your better modifier, but that is not the way it works at all. The way it works is absolutely bizarre. What matters is, which class did you last take a first level in? That one is the ability modifier that gets used. She started off as level 1 Cleric, then she went level 1 Wizard, then she went back to Cleric. So the important thing is, Wizard is the most recent first level. So all her abilities from items and things like that use intelligence from Wizard. They don't use Wisdom. If she now multiclasses something like Sorcerer, suddenly all you're supposed to use her terrible charisma instead. So watch out for that. Order really, really matters for spellcasting ability modifier in this game. You need to understand how that works. The most recent first level. That's what determines it. Karlak also has great, great battlefield control because her spells are pretty much irresistible. Her spell save DC is great just as a base from having, you know, plus six intelligence modifier, of course. But beyond that, she's got ways to enhance it too. Like this hat here. Whenever she uses thunder damage, which she can do in every single attack as a Tempest Cleric next level, she gets another level of Arcane Acuity, which adds plus to her spell save DC and also to her attack rolls. And she has the elixir of Battle Mage's power for another plus three, too. And other party members can lower enemy saving throws, too. While this can do cutting words, we'll soon talk about Menthara, who can lower enemy spell saves with things like this. So basically, enemies cannot succeed their saving throws against Karlak. It's really, really strong. She also, because it's kind of important in this act, has the blood of Lathander, because almost every enemy is vulnerable to the Lathander's light in this act, so you want someone to have that and have good movement speed. So she therefore has Crusher's Ring, and also has these boost letter dashes that can bring Lathander's light over to enemies and make them have this advantage and make me have advantage against them. Really, really valuable stuff. And just kind of to add a bit of damage, she has this necklace giving her plus six to their damage on the cantrips that she casts, and she also has... This, letting her then add Arcane Synergy, which adds her 6 Intelligence again to her damage with her offhand crossbows, so very strong stuff overall for a primary caster. Next up, we've got Minthar. Now, Minthar is kind of the odd one out here. See, she's replacing Lei Boying Zell as my druid, but druids are no longer as good as they used to be when I started this run. See, the original goal was to be a Spore Druid in Act 3 and get the Spore Keeper's Armor, which at the time I started this run let you do unlimited casts of Haste Spores, which is just the best ability in the game, almost. So having a Spore Druid is worth it just for that alone. But they patched that, so now it's only once per long rest, which for me is almost worthless. So Spore Druid kind of went from being amazing to being mediocre, but I don't really want for my challenge run to change my builds, so I plan to stick with it, or maybe be some other kind of Druid, but... Not a chance of having a druid at the very least. Now, Minthara as a drow is good as a druid because it gives her hand crossbow proficiency, which druids don't normally get, so that's appreciated because hand crossbows are amazing in this game. And Minthara also has this totally unique ability called Soul Branding here, which is great team assistance. What it describes itself as is already good, but it's even better than it says. It says it gives 1.5 meters of bonus speed, it actually gives 5 meters, so that's just amazing speed. Infinite use. So, what's not to love about that? Then, of course, as a druid, Minthara has almost unmatched battlefield control at this level, because she now has a Dryad. And that Dryad has at-will spike growth. Being able to cast this massive AoE battlefield control every single turn is amazing sustainable battlefield control. I can plunk it down wherever I want, and enemies just can't move through that anymore without taking massive damage. Or I can cast Entangle, or she has, of course, her own spike growth she can cast, or other battlefield control spells like plant growth. So, druid is great for that kind of thing, and has great summons, too. She'll eventually be the best summoner in the party, with her 1-level wizard and her druid levels as well. 
She adds some damage for being a Spore Druid, but really it's not a big deal, especially given enemies often resist necrotic damage, which is the Spore Druid's main thing in this act. So really she is more about the party support and brings that with things like these gloves to add penalties to enemy saving throws, and these ones make them have weaker saving throws too. And So she really is just kind of built to support the team, do battlefield control, and make it so the enemies will fail their saving throws without really being a good damage dealer herself. But, you know, her summons do an okay job at that too. So that sums up my party as they exist right now. I might make a follow-up build video as we get maybe deeper into the act, maybe around level 10 when I have a few more items to talk about. But for the time being, that sums up what I plan to do for most of Act 2 at the very least. Let me know if you have any questions about these builds or suggestions or build ideas of your own. Happy to discuss those. Thank you for watching. And a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. Master Knight DH, Jackie, and Lino, Travis, Carlo Andrea 97, Cthulhu's Mom, Oliver, Andrew Curzon, Trubzy, Skill Rap, Gregory, William Wakefield, Danny Hall, Jeffrey Morse, Just, Becca, Jack, Mishas01, Jacob Marshall, Nubiana, Till Fisher, Discord Colossus, Nicholas Schmuck, Kostia Nesterovich, Goman Blackrock, Dodo King 4, Marson Bialik, Techno Waffle, Nebular, I Lu, Michael Francis, Emperor Kong 420, Robin Mackey, Mick and Balls, Stige and Flamey, Micah Murray, Christopher Allen, Stefan Van Zyl, Eddie, Wendy, Ali Kasamoglu, Lucas Riverola, Skylar Sauce, Nick Myers, Bethany James, Emp Ninjas, Preben, Mango Jelly, and Chupaton. Have a great day, everyone.